how he's responding to this current situation? Um, I've been impressed. You know, he was appropriately disappointed when it first happened, but uh, he very quickly got himself into the plan. Uh, our medical staff's done a great job of laying out a plan, not only for like day to day, but uh, he knows what to expect over the coming months. Uh, he has things he can strive for. He's a driven person. Uh, and I think that's important for him from a motivational standpoint. And he's taken the type of approach that gives us a lot of encouragement for when he's playing. You know, like I've said before, his, uh, his approach to this will not only impact getting healthy, but, you know, how he, how he is when he's on the other side of it. Is he stronger because of the experience? And that's obviously the goal. How involved do you want him to be in learning things? Like, you want him on the side, like next to the coaches, or just, just watching film? Um, not at the expense of his his rehab, especially this early on. Like a guy like Shea that's going to be back in a few weeks, you know, we want him around because he's going to be playing soon. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about that, you know, to be honest with you, and um, he does some stuff during practice just to make sure he doesn't have like nine-hour days here because if he did everything outside of the practice window, uh, it would really extend his day and could drain him over time. So there's a balance there. He's out there with us at times, and there's other times where he's doing, um, you know, his rehab stuff. But right now the priority is his health, and he's getting supplemental work, you know, with coaches, with film and stuff like that. He's, he's learning as he goes, but uh, nothing's a higher priority than his foot and getting him healthy right now. On the mental side for the team so far, um, what have you picked up? What have you noticed? What have you guys kind of gone over uh, in terms of that, that side of the ball? Um, I, you know, a lot of continuity is showing up, like I've mentioned before. Um, you know, having the same guys that have been here now for, you know, two, three years has been really, really helpful. The continuity from having a summer league and having a full off season is showing up. Uh, we look like a basketball team that's that's like done it before. You know, we're introducing stuff, but it's really like refreshes uh, more so than like, hey, this is what this is. Uh, and so that's been pretty cool. Um, the competitive level's been good. Uh, the focus level's been good. You know, again, it's different when you know what's coming. You know, you're you're preparing in context, and uh, we've got a lot of guys on the team that are able to do that, and it sets a tone for the guys that don't know what's coming. You know, they kind of look around and they're like, okay, you know. This stuff's serious. We got to get this right. We got to get this tight. We got to get this ready because we're we're heading out there here pretty soon. Because of that continuity, are you able to dive in more into maybe sort of those tactical X's and O's versus just kind of like the general foundational stuff that you lay out early in training camp? Uh, we try not to skip the steps on that. You know, um, we want guys to understand what we're doing, why we're doing it is really important because it allows them to make decisions, uh, you know, on the fly out there in the game, which they end up having to do. Um, the continuity is more helpful in like flow of the practice and, and sense of purpose with what we're doing. You know, if it's the first time you've ever done something, you're simultaneously trying to figure it out uh, and just get through it and get it done, but you're not really doing it with a sense of purpose. And that's for anybody doing anything that's new. When you've got a team that has been through it before, you know, they're doing the same thing they've always done, but there's a sense of purpose to it. There's context to it. They understand why we're doing it and how it shows up in the game. And uh, what are these lighter practice days look like for you? Uh, today wasn't really lighter, you know. It was, you know, it's third day at camp, and we've got a recovery day on Saturday. So uh, we were non-contact. We weren't like body on body today, but we were moving pretty good, and we went for a while. Um, you know, a lot of install. It was, it was full speed. I mean, there was a, a high bar today. You feel like you guys are more advanced at this point now than you were last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And again, continuity, of the team, uh, length of the off season, that those both contribute to that. Um, no one's falling behind, that's for sure. You know, there's no one out there that you're just like, man, this guy's like miles away. Um, there's a few guys that, that look particularly good. Robinson Earl stands out. You know, he just looks like a like an older player. The maturity of that guy is definitely popping. Poku looks really good in the same way. He's this is his um yeah, you know, he's just cruising along. You know, he's he's this is as as solid as he's looked as a player. Um Baisley, you know, not a lot of identity drift there. Wiggins, Baisley, Cambridge Williams, those guys are really playing inside of themselves. Um, Trey Mann, like we said, had a good summer. Josh Giddies looked like a you know multi-year player. 
um, there's been a lot of encouraging signs. No one's like really popping ahead of the fray, and no one's really falling behind. Um, going back to JRE, just what are some of the areas you that, that seem noticeable improvements um, since the off season? Just for a guy who's as versatile as he is in a lot of positions. Yeah, his body uh, looks tighter. I mean, he he he's huge and he's moving better, which is really rare. Usually they get bigger. Like Trey Man got bigger. Poku's gotten stronger. Um, it's rare that you see a guy like more athletic, and I think you guys saw that in summer league. Like he's got a different level of pop. Uh, he did a hell of a job uh, with the summer, um, and then his communication. He's the best on court communicator we have. Um, which again, you know, for a guy that only has a year of experience and he, was, he missed six weeks with an injury, um, he just he knows what's going on. He anticipates it. He's he's wired to talk, um, and it really helps. It's a it's a really important skill to glue the team together out there. Eugene's one of the few guys that's not a returner. Um, just probably your first chance to get him in camp uh, under your eyes. What have you thought of him so far? Good motor, physical, um, tone setter. That's what he has to be for us. And no, and so you know, for us, it's trying to get him, um, you know, up to the point where he's executing things at a high level. You can't you can't just be physical without execution. You got to have both, and you can't execute without being physical. He's got the physicality. Um, that's just a natural uh, DNA in his game. But now it's just a matter of learning the stuff and applying the physicality in a way that helps the team and that you know isn't tr you know. Racking up fouls and stuff like that. Just wanted to clarify, you said Shay will be back in a few weeks. Does that mean you already reevaluated him? No, no. I just, I was just talking. Sorry. <laughs> it's the last, last time I speak freely. I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, Mark, I believe right now you have like 16 active players compared to the normal 20. Uh, yeah. Does that change anything with your workflow and how you manage these guys in camp? Not really. I like it more, to be honest with you. 20 is tough. You know, 20 is really tough in terms of reps, especially when you bring the whole team together. You know, if you're doing a four and four drill, you know, and you got eight guys out there on the court and 20 guys are in the practice, there's 12 guys that are not doing anything. So, um, you know, 16 is a really manageable number. It's a good number. So you talked about all the outside things that young teams have to deal with, whether it's social media, outside noise. What's something as a coach that you can help? How, how can you help combat that? Um, I don't. I don't really believe in combating it as like a head-on collision, you know, and like trying to compete with it. I think it's more creating an environment of like presence and an environment that makes it easy to commit to, you know, ultimately, you know, you can threaten guys and say, you know, stay off your phone. But um, really it's about providing a team environment that when they're in it, um, they, they'd rather be plugged into the team environment than plugged in anywhere else. And, um, I've always felt like that's the best way, you know, to to deal with the outside noise. Is like they, your program and what you do every day has to be worthy of their commitment. You know, if it's not worthy of their commitment, that's our fault. Random question. Another Springsteen question. <laughs> you hit me hard with those the last My couple mom of days. Said, Listen, the tunnel of love. Um, is that good? Tell your mom I've listened to everything multiple times, and Tunnel of Love I know very well. <laughs> but, um, you said your mom, right? No, my boss. Oh, your boss. Yeah. Okay. There's only one boss. Tell your boss there's only one boss. <laughs> wow. um, what you just said, not going to spring things up, but it made me think of where did your, your coaching philosophy come from? Um, I've, I've had great opportunities, first of all, from the people that I've worked with prior to coming here to being hired here when I was, you know, um, as a G League coach. Like, I was not qualified for that job. Um, that was a projection by Sam. Um, and so opportunity is a huge part of it. Uh, and then trial and error is a huge part of it. I mean, I was a G League coach for five years, and um, that's a lot of games between G League, Summer League. I probably coached close to 300 games before I got to the NBA, and that, that's a lot of mistakes in there. You know, a lot of things that work, things that don't work, uh, a lot of things that work in some contexts and not others. I've coached a lot of different types of players over that time. Um, and so uh, it's been kind of forged out of the opportunities that I've been given by a, a lot of really, really competent, good people. Uh, and then also the experiences I've had. You mentioned Poku. A year ago, you were talking about tightening the screws on Poku. They're tighter. Okay. So what's different? Like what looks different out on the court? His body looks different. Specifically, his lower body. Um, you know, his, his base and, and leg, he looks way more balanced um, than he's ever looked. Um, and then there's just a, an awareness of um, his own game 
and an awareness of uh, the efficiency that he needs to play with to be a good player. Um, the combination of those things coming together are, are impressive. Like he's he's he looks good. You know he um, the awareness of his own game specifically. Like he's really he's forged himself into like a connector. And at the beginning when we first drafted him. Um, he was a guy that could play with the ball a little bit. You're tempted to put him in pick and roll. And what he's really become is like kind of a secondary playmaker where he'll catch it, he'll turn it, he'll get us to the next action. He connects offense side to side. Um, it's not a slight on him. Draymond Green's a connector. I mean, there's great connectors in the NBA that are great players. Um, and he's also, he rolls out of there and he's seven feet tall. So he's a big target. And if you throw it to him with an advantage, then he can really get his passing into the game. Um, and defensively, you know, he's physical enough at this point. His body's strong enough, and he's, the length has become more of a factor for him. So, um, you know, he's he's to be taken seriously. I mean, he's I give him a lot of credit because he's obviously had a lot of ups and downs in his first couple of years. But um, if a spaceship came down and dropped him here and we had never seen him before, we'd be like, man, this guy's a really good player. And he's he's turned himself into that. He's done a really good job. So, Coach, how do you balance, like, so guys come into training camp, they want to show out, they want to be, you know, playmakers, this and that. But how do you balance that with how a guy fits in with a group or a variety of different groups? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, it, it's really about identifying what your strengths are, what your game is, and then bring those strengths. That's how you can contribute to the team, and ultimately that's how you can show out. Um, it's a really good question because I think there's a temptation – especially out of ambitious players, they're, they're trying to make themselves felt. Um, and what we try to do is give them a lot of confidence in who they are. And guys like Wiggins, for example, last year, you know, we really try to be clear. Amaru is another good example. Poku is a great example where we try to be very clear on how they can bring their strengths to the team, and we try to acknowledge them when they do that. Baisley's doing that right now. He's playing uh, as tight of a style of play as he's had since he's been here. And... Um, you know, we try to reward them when they do that, show them the impact that has on the team, and that's the way you show out in a training camp is by being who you are and being really good at who you are. That's what the best players in the NBA do, regardless of what type of game they have and how good they are. Mark, on the spaceship comment, yep. people like us, we watched Poku for two years. Yep. And it's going to take a long time for us to get all that out of our mind. Yep. How easy is it for a coach to... Like let a guy sort of start fresh and, and not hold what you've seen in the past against him, if it's negative. Um, it, yeah, there's negatives for every young player. I mean, he's 19 when we drafted him, and he was highly inefficient and not physical enough. I mean, obviously he wasn't ready. I think we all knew that. Um, but I, we owe him that, you know. This is his life. This is his career. We owe him that. Um you know, shame on us if we're judging players for, you know, the players that they were. That We're about development, and we have to put our money where our mouth is. And um, I give him a lot of credit. And, you know, I think sometimes when they're rookies, then we're more focused on their development. You know, you're, we're going to be focused on Jang's development right now because he's new and he's 19 and he's, he just screams development. But Baisley, Poku, Lou Dort... I mean, Lou Dort, I said yesterday, he's younger than a guy that was in the draft this past year. You know, he's still a developing player. Shea's still a developing player. And, um, you know, we're pushing him really hard, and we're telling him to attack the program. And if they do that, they deserve to be rewarded for that, and just with the acknowledgement of it. And so um, it, you have to discipline yourself, I think, to do it. I certainly catch myself not doing that, but they deserve that from us. Is it hard to determine starters for a team like this where he's, you have a lot of guys kind of on the same plane. Yeah. How do you determine that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's definitely not a, a loud starting five, to your point. And um, the way that I've tried to look at it up until this point and in camp is like more rotational concepts, you know, like who can play with who. If we've got this out there, what else needs to be out there for this to be effective? Um, obviously, we're going to be, the five position is going to be you know, fluid this year, and the styles of our fives are a lot different. Um, and that that's going to have a trickle down on really, you know, who else is out there with them. Um, what coverage is the five playing? If it's Favors, he's probably like a coverage guy. If it's Mascala, he's a coverage guy. Jalen Williams, coverage guy. So you probably need more pursuit defenders out there with those guys. If it's a switchable guy, if you're playing Baisley or, you know, even Poku there, um, you know, then you want switchable guards, you know. So, like, 
it, more thinking about that and then backing into a uh, rotation and starting lineup. But the one thing I'll say on the, the starting lineup for you guys is we're going to take a lot in the pre- t- look at a lot of things in the preseason. Um, and where we start the regular season is going to be a starting point, not an end point. You know, so whatever we roll out there in Minnesota is not our starting lineup. Um, it's our first look at our first rotation against our first team, and then our second look will be against Denver. Was the idea of that starting lineup, was it louder when Chet was healthy? You knew going in, not just with him, but everybody that you would play on the floor with, or was it more defined prior to the injury um, in your mind? No, but mainly because of the player. He, you know, he's so unique that um, he's an undefined player right now. So it's like hard to, like I still don't know with Chet. Like, is he going to be more effective guarding perimeters? You know, where you know, like Giannis, Durant, the way they use those guys defensively. Draymond Green, they put them on perimeter players that really aren't great shooters, and they plug those guys off, and they're like an extra help defender, like a free safety. Um, or is his rim protection, is he, you know, do you use him like Gobert, where you just park him back there and you make their teams to finish over him? It's probably going to be a combination of the two after seeing him play a little bit. But because he's so undefined on both ends of the floor, um, you know, we're not going in with any sort of projections. This kind of like to Barry's question, you know, like it's more about giving him a shot, seeing what it looks like, assessing it, letting it evolve, staying open to everything we learn. I mean, ultimately, we think that's how we're going to maximize the team. Coach, this team is so young and can play so fast. Do you envision that pressure kind of leading to success with the new transition take foul, or is that something you haven't really looked into yet? Transition dig file is like a, a big deal, um, especially for us. I mean, we have a lot of international players, and so they're they're really well conditioned at taking those fouls, and they're very intelligent with it. So we're going to have to rewire that a little bit. That's actually a, a big deal for us. We haven't covered it yet, but it's a big deal. This was a thing the other day, but how do you pronounce her name? Degnault. <laughs> Let's end on that one. <laughs>